Hello, everyone. I'm <laughs> Melissa A. Weber, curator of the Hogan Archive of New Orleans Music and New Orleans Jazz, a unit of Tulane University Special Collections, or TUSC for short. <laughs> I'd like to welcome you to our session, Archiving Jazz Fest, hosted by TUSC and featuring Rachel Lyons, archivist with the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Archive. Today's event is presented as the closing event for the Tusk exhibition titled Music is the Scene, Jazz Fest's First Decade, 1970 to 1979, which features materials primarily from Tusk collections, most of which have not been widely seen or heard. The exhibition has been on view in the Tusk Gallery since March 4th and will close in the gallery tomorrow at 4 p.m. However, the digital exhibition will remain on view past tomorrow as part of Tulane mm -hmm. online exhibits. If you haven't seen it yet, we invite you to view it online at exhibits.tulane.edu. And I'm gonna post those links in the chat. Our event today is dedicated to hearing directly from Rachel, who I'd like <laughs> to thank for her gracious assistance through my curating the Tusk exhibition. And like you, I'm looking forward to hearing about her important work as archivist for the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Foundation since July 2000. She has grown the archive from a collection of a few dozen boxes in an unrenovated building into a vibrant research facility with numerous collections in extensive offsite storage facilities. In addition to maintaining and managing the collections, she has made presentations and curated exhibitions about New Orleans culture and the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival. For Jazz Fest's 50th anniversary, Rachel played a key role as compiler, writer, and producer in the creation of the Smithsonian Folkways Recordings box set, Jazz Fest, the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival. With the COVID-19 pandemic cancellation, she partnered with New Orleans community radio station, WWOZFM, to produce three jazz festing in place programs. These 64 hour programs featured jazz fest recordings exclusively from the Jazz and Heritage Archive and reached listeners in 195 countries and territories worldwide. Rachel is going to share a presentation, and after that, we'll be able to have conversation with a few questions from me and also from you. Please feel free to share your questions for Rachel about her work or archiving Jazz Fest in the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen. And now I'm thrilled to pass the mic to you, Rachel. Oh, well, thank you so much, Melissa. Um, and I really appreciate this opportunity to uh, talk with you and uh, to hear what some other folks have to uh, say and ask about, you know, the work that we do archiving. <laughs> um, and I'm just going to share my screen. Okay. Um, I'm just going to start because I know uh, many of you all are already familiar with the festival. But I'm going to give a little precursor about the festival and about the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Foundation, which is who I report to, and then uh, a little bit more in depth about the archive. But I want to make sure that everybody starts on the same page in terms of the origins of the festival. Um, so the festival was started by George Ween uh, in 1970. That was the first year. And at that time, he met Quint Davis and Allison Minor, who were both um, working in the Hogan Jazz Archive. Allison was actually employed there and Quint was a student worker. Um, and they initially met because they had um, apartments near each other on Frenchmen. So they were across balconies from each other. So prior to uh, the actual festival, they actually uh, had met. So um, they were brought on as the young people that can do some work uh, for little or no money, because, of course, this was a new operation. Uh, the picture at the top is George uh, with his wife, Joyce, and then uh, the woman in white is, of course, Sister Gertrude Morgan, who's a very famous uh, 
folk artist, and she actually, it's her artwork that is the cover of the very first program book. And Okay, there we go. <laughs> um, so a lot of this information I uh, achieved from doing those uh, exhibits that I've done. So at the top is actually an architectural drawing of the 1972 festival, which is the first year at the fairgrounds. Um, and I really love these two aspects together um, because, you know, they really show how the footprint of the festival and how it continues uh, to grow. Uh, Curtis and Davis, that's Quint's father's architectural firm uh, who came in and helped. And there are other drawings like this that are actually at the HNOC, the Historic New Orleans collection in the Winston Lill. Uh, so the festival was always incorporated as a nonprofit. It was always the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Foundation. Um, and a lot of the early energy of the of the festival, uh, you know, that took up most of the time and attention. In the mid to late uh, 70s, like 76, 77, 78, is when uh, there started to be some proceeds from the festival going into the foundation. And it was at that point that the board of directors um, started to develop philanthropic work. So our Community grants program started at that time. It still exists now. We give out over a million dollars a year in grants to the community. Um, but one of the other things they did was to buy the first part of this very long series of buildings that we now own on Rampart Street. Um, to the left of the 1205 door is the Liberty Bar. So it's kind of apropos, but you would go in that middle door, which doesn't exist anymore, and you'd be on the back side of the bar, and then you'd go upstairs to the offices. So this is uh, the foundation today. That corner spot that was the Liberty Bar is our main entrance. There's a small gallery in there where we do hold community events. And then you can see there's two other townhouses that go down the block from there that are also our offices. And then the white building beyond that is the George Ween uh, Jazz and Heritage Center. So George Ween, uh, you know, gave us a lot of support uh, throughout the years and the building is named after him in his honor. Uh, this is a 10,000 square foot building that we opened in 2015. It is a completely free music school in the historic front of the building. There's a room with every instrumentation in there. Uh, there's a room of pianos, there's a room full of drums, there's a room full of bass, and there's a room for vocals. So um, we've, it was a $10 million renovation to do that. And then we have a small performance venue in the back, um, which holds about 200 people. So we use the building a lot. And then we also, there's a lot of community events that also um, happen in the building. Um, and the nice thing about having this building is we have a lot of parking now in the back, um, especially like when we're having the kids dropped off and picked up, it works out very well. Uh, so the foundation is organized uh, in terms of assets and programs. Uh, the archive is an asset, WWOZ is an asset, uh, the Heritage School of Music is an asset and also Jazz Fest. So were the core activities that, uh, I guess the way to describe it is we are the ones that have the things. So beyond office programming, um, we're the ones that have all of this physical material, whether for me for collections and OZ will have soundboards um, and other technology and of course recording trucks that are at Jazz Fest. Uh, we run programs under uh, economic development. Um, one of the first things we did when the pandemic hit was we gave out a uh, million dollars in funding across the state to musicians. Um, and then we gave out another million dollars of our own money. Uh, and we also partnered with like Spotify. They helped us raise money. Michael Murphy helped us raise some money. 
Um, so we do look for key partnerships. And most recently, Music Rising partnered with us and they ran a guitar auction and uh, raised $1.4 million. And that's all money that came to us were the uh, financial partners that work. Uh, one of the other things we do, and these are all the upcoming dates uh, for our, our uh, community, what we call the community festivals, they're all free. We do have people asking for donations. So if you can give, uh, we appreciate y'all giving um, and certainly coming out and attending. So uh, we've merged uh, the Creole Gumbo and Congo Square Rhythms into one festival this year. Um, but other than that, we're, we just keep them, keep them rolling and keep them out there. Uh, this also is in some ways economic development because we do see this as providing work and jobs to not just musicians, but also the food vendors and the stage workers and people like that. Uh, now we're gonna move on to the archive. So Allison Miner, who was the festival founder was also the founder of this archive. Uh, she started it uh, in spirit uh, from her work at the Hogan. So the core of the collection is the recordings from the music heritage stage. That's a picture of Allison uh, on the very first stage in um, 1988. And then it was started to be recorded in 89. So we have uh, just shy of a thousand interviews at that point. Uh, Allison did pass away in uh, 1995, uh, so she's no longer with us. She was in her 40s, so she was quite young when she passed. So this is the archive. The building was donated um, to the foundation by Ian Hardcastle. It was the old Solney's Hardware Building for any of you old school New Orleanians out there. Um, the space is quite small, we're a thousand square feet. Um, you can see our shelving, we're really at capacity. We've had three different configurations of shelving, but the good news is, is that there's always offsite storage. Uh, so this is what the building looked like when I got here. Um, you can see the boxes were everywhere. It was sort of crumbling in another state. Um, but it was literally uh, get a folding table and buy a computer. So that's what I had to do. Now, these are some of our offsite storage areas. The two at the top are in town. Um, and we do, you can see, we have large decor items uh, with the signage, some furniture from furniture makers, business records, we have a lot of that. Um, the picture at the bottom is all of the early OZ reels that were here when I got here, 1300 reel to reel tapes. Those are stored in Tennessee, um, but we had to pull them back because we ended up getting money uh, to digitize them after Katrina. So uh, that's Dolores and she's five feet tall. So that'll give you an idea what 1300 reel to reel tapes look like. <laughs> Um, this is the Michael Murphy collection. Uh, all these materials are in Los Angeles. They, um, it's a diversity of media. He filmed Jazz Fest from 1989 to 2009. So about half of this collection is Murphy and then the other are, is Jazz Fest and the other half of it is other uh, more music related materials. Uh, but it's all very relevant in terms of our mission. So we're extraordinarily fortunate to have this collection. You've heard a lot of it if you've listened to Jazz Festing in Place or if you have the Smithsonian box set. So here is our Smithsonian box set from uh, 2019. Uh, this was an amazing project. Uh, we did it in under a year when it normally would have taken like a year and a half. So uh, I'd never done anything like this before, but you just buckle up and you put your head down and you go. Um, Dave Ankers with OZ is also a producer on this. His help was amazing. Carrie Boer, who runs the OZ social media, she helped me a lot with the, um, 
with the uh, photo research, which was an enormous help because I had my fingers in all these other little pots there, but then also all of my regular work too. Uh, but I'm very proud and it got to number three on the Billboard Jazz Charts. Um, so we mentioned the jazz festing in place. So that is all um, happened. You know, you can see those. But also recently we um, created this documentary with Michael Murphy and WYES, which is our local public um, television station. And we just got news two days ago that it won a Silver Telly Award. So we're very excited. It is on a national PBS distribution. So 270 stations picked it up across the country. So we're super excited about having that. And then of course, now, if you all don't know, there's a big movie coming out about Jazz Fest. It's Kennedy Marshall are the producers. And um, that's a big two hour movie. They filmed the 2019 festival in IMAX. So there is a ton of amazing footage. So I'd say it's more, um, more of a uh, performance based of the festival but it also has uh, probably about 25% historical information in it. And so I worked very closely with the producers um, in identifying assets that are here, but also in other archives in the city. So uh, I worked very closely with them to uh, get this movie out the door and produce, which I was very pleased and excited uh, to help them. So that is the end of my talk. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for that presentation. And we're now going to get into a little conversation and then Q&A. And I'd like to re remind everyone that if you have a question for Rachel about her work, please type it into the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen. And uh, we've got quite some time. Uh, I will start with a few questions for you, Rachel. So I'm not sure if if you heard about this or not, probably so. I just saw a tweet last night that this past Tuesday, <laughs> the U.S. Senate agreed by unanimous consent on a resolution that honors the 1970 Jazz Fest. And you gave a little bit of, of insight into the origins of the festival, but I was wondering if you could share a little more uh, detail on how the festival started. So I will say I am, I mean, we're very fortunate. We did an interview with this gentleman. I, I do do a series of institutional oral histories as well. So we'll interview past presidents of the board and, um, you know, longtime stage managers or people who work at the festival. So pretty much anybody who's core uh, to the festival and to the Jazz and Heritage Foundation. So one of the people that we ended up interviewing was Earl Duffy, and he was the very first board president of the foundation. And it was fascinating because he was from Boston. Uh, he was big with the Hotel Motel Association. He was the one who got the call from the local chapter here in the mid 60s saying, we'd like to start a festival down here. And they were looking for some help uh, with financial money, but also other support. Now, Earl is from Boston and he used to go to George Ween's club Storyville that was in Boston for many years. George was born and raised in Boston. I don't know if y'all know that. Um, so anyway, so we, it, we did an extensive interview with him. And what I found is people that have very short periods of time, they, um, they remember things. So he was our board president in 70 and 71. And he really gave a very colorful, detailed description of what it was like, A, to come down here from someplace north and run the Royal Sinesta Hotel um, but also about, you know, it really starting in that he had almost like the pre 
work with them. And what he found when he got here in 70, and he was asked by uh, Lester Kabakoff, Prez Kabakoff's father, who owned the Dauphine Orleans, to come in and be the board president. And he did, and he found this sort of wild group of guys, you know, that were still living a kind of a madman life style as his board members. These are people that he was inheriting from the 69 festival, which is not our festival because it was not incorporated as the foundation. So it was basically him and Darrell Black, uh, the one very useful guy on that board that really pushed and made the festival happen in 70 along with George. So uh, yeah, so it was, uh, it was a very interesting time and just, it was the good old boy network, you know, and a little bit of Mad Men thrown in there from everything he described. <laughs> He was a lovely man. He was such a lovely, he came down for the ribbon cutting and he and George got to talk and see each other. It was touching. These two 95 year old guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask a, an archives related question. You know, you were speaking about the amazing Smithsonian box set and you had to work on that project in addition to your regular work. For the average person who doesn't know what the regular work of archives involves, describe what that is. All right. So um, we're so small here. I mean, you know, other archives are small, but they're in libraries. You know, so there's some other institutional memory. You know, in the foundation here, we have 13 full-time employees. We do not have internal IT. Um, we're, we've gone full-blown forward. We're starting a digital archive. Um, so a lot of my work is, I'm handling a lot, especially now with requests to use the material. So I do a lot of administrative stuff and then I periodically dip into collections. Um, Dolores, who used to work with us full-time, she still works with us part-time. And then we hired Joe to start the digital archive. So we have that. Uh, I've been so sad without our volunteers because we've had, a, for as long as I've been here, we've had this fabulous group of, you know, they've varied over the years, but they come in every week. They come in for four hours and we give them real projects to do that help us with the collection. Like nobody's picking up my dry cleaning. Uh, you know, nobody's making photocopies, uh, but we do give them actual work of archiving. Um, and that's very important. So whether it's, it could be something digitally based or it could be something um, that's a physical collection that we break up parts of it to get it moving forward okay so yeah so we're um we haven't instituted our volunteer program back quite yet um but i'm looking forward to getting that done either during the summer or in the fall okay and what are the types of materials that your archive includes and what are items that are the most popular that are requested for access uh well audio and video is the big one because everybody's making a documentary. Um, very few, well, I guess no. I would say video and photography are probably bigger. Audio is not so much. And I think it's because, especially with the internet, you know, and everything, social media, everything is so visually based that um, the audio isn't quite as attractive. Um, I, so our scope of collecting is the history of the foundation. So it's pretty much anything foundation or uh, festival related. We do dip a little bit into the 69, 68 festival, but there are other archives in town that have stuff for that. So if something happens to come in our door, you know, from those festivals, we'll keep it, but for the most part, we're not actively collecting those materials. Um, but I do say I have the history of the beer koozie um, because I have some very early prototypes of like the hard styrofoam, uh, you know, with the ring and it has our logo on it. Um, 
but we also have a lot of artwork. So um, the Hellas Foundation gave us, um, I think about $150,000 to buy artwork for the Wien Center. So uh, yeah, so we have everything, even our beer koozies are insured under a fine art policy. But we keep track of all of the materials, whether they're in one of our storage units or whether they're hanging on a wall at the main office. That's that falls under our purview. <laughs> and then also there are the digital collections, which I love because anyone, wherever they may be on their computer can access uh, various collections. Tell us about the digital component of your archives. Okay, um, so that's also, that's really in transition at this point. Um, we do have an online catalog. Um, only some of the things on there can actually be viewed. So basically it's the Allison Minor Music Heritage Stage from 2012 forward. And of course, all of this is dealing with copyright law and making sure we have the right to do it. Um, but also, uh, you know, we have to be respectful because it's not just our relationship with the music community and the arts community in town, but also OZ's relationship with those folks and the festival. So there's very little that you can actually, well, I say very little, but 2012, you know, that 40 interviews a year, there's actually quite a few videos you could watch in our online catalog. Um, and then we're in the process of setting up a dam for all of our born digital photography, which I manage uh, nine photographers uh, every year. Uh, at Jazz Fest, there's nine each weekend that photograph for the archive. So they're photographing stages, they're photographing the food, the people, the culture, uh, what the festival actually looks like, like the landscape of it. Um, so anyway, yeah, and then a lot of what we have, you know, is not even necessarily in our catalog at this point, like all of the Michael Murphy films and audio. Um, but that is something that we are accessing in having people use uh, for their work, you know, because we're not gonna stop just because, you know, it's not in our catalog. We're, uh, we're pretty aggressive and very focused on the user and trying to make things as available as possible. Okay. Yeah. So awesome. call me, call me or email me is the answer if you have a question. <laughs> Aren't the posters now online, can't you? I mean, not the posters, the programs. Oh, um, yes. Um, so we did, um, we did scan and OCR all of the program books. And those are in our online catalog. They're downloadable. They can be completely searched. So if you know that, you know, your father, you know, your grandfather or whatever worked you know, because even the staff is in there. So you could find staff names if you just did a nice like last name search. So that's been really sweet. Yeah, and that's a very easy way of doing it. You can just download them. So we're very happy about that, getting resources to the people. Awesome. I have just one more question and then I'm going, going to shift to some of the questions that have been popping up in the Q&A box. So... As I understand and know, no archival repository can represent all stories of materials are not there. For instance, while I was <laughs> curating the Tusk <laughs> exhibition, you shared info with me about the 1978 coin due effort. And I realized that we didn't have materials at Tusk to represent that story. So thank you for giving us permission to display coin due photos um, from your archive that are included in the in-person version of the exhibition. So my question is two parts. One, can you share the story of Coindu with our audience? Because it's a fascinating one that I didn't know. And two, are there materials that are missing in the Jazz and Heritage Archive that you wish you had or could find? Um. So there's one thing I forgot from the previous question I'm just gonna plug, which is also from the archive website, there is the Jazz Fest database, which is a very simple utility and it is based on the program book. So that's a caveat that if there was a last minute cancellation, we may not have known it from 1986 or something. 
but it is completely searchable of everybody who's ever performed at Jazz Fest. We put in the canceled Jazz Fest too. So just to make sure that we were gonna have a complete record. So the canceled Jazz Fests are in there. There's about 25,000 records in the Jazz Fest database that is open for anybody to search. I actually use it quite a bit, like on my phone, I'll just run into it. Um, so with Coindu, um, the, and we did curate an exhibit. I, we have a couple of collaborators, some cultural anthropologists that have studied Jazz Fest and uh, their names are Helen Regis, she's at LSU and Shauna Walton, she's at Nichols State. And um, they were really the lead people in uh, curating that exhibit and doing some oral histories around it. Um, so it came out of in the mid seventies, there was sort of a crackdown going on a lot of the street vendors on Canal Street who were predominantly African-American and the city was cracking down on them um, and sort of hassling them and not really liking, you know, sort of how it was beginning to look like a street fair and not so much like a main shopping corridor like you would have thought, you know, a decade before. Um, and with that interaction, uh, the African-American Jazz Fest Coalition uh, came up as well. So they uh, were putting pressure on the foundation to really uh, start, uh, like the impression was of course that we had a ton of money, but the reality was, was we started growing and having some money, you know, because we bought a building. and There was that sort of effort. So they were very, uh, firm about the fact that they wanted more participation in the festival. Um, and there was a big call, they were threatening to boycott. Um, and what happened at that point, and uh, Kalama Yasalam was one of the leads uh, with this group, along with Sekou Fela and a handful of other people. So uh, they basically, for, and George Ween actually writes about this in his New Orleans chapter in his book about going to the St. Bernard Project and having a meeting with them. Um, but basically what came out of it was Coindu um, was started and it was like a festival inside of a festival. And, but they worked directly, you know, because it had to be facilitated into the fairground. So there had to be some kind of overlap an administration, but it was solely run by the uh, African American Jazz Fest Coalition or Coindu Group. Um, those uh, that organization fell apart, um, and it was primarily due because there was a difference on you know how it was going to be administered. So it's kind of interesting when I was doing research on it because. In the board meeting minutes, it was like, well, we don't know what's happening. But at this point, eight years later, you know, they still had an imprint there. So um, what happened was they were in court, the two aspects, they were suing each other. And then um, Tom Dent, who was our uh, director at the time, you know, noted writer, uh, from New Orleans, he was our executive director, and Kalama Yasalam, they both ran the Congo Square Writers Circle. And they renamed the Coindu area Congo Square, and it became more integrated into the festival itself at that point, which was 1988. So thank you. And also, <laughs> are there materials that you wish you? had or could find? Um, from Coindu? Oh, for just related to Jazz Fest. I remember uh, you asked about the logo that could be what the original logo prototype. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, a lot of that I found in my, uh, I found out in my research along the way. Um, I still, I still learn things though every day. I mean, I just, I just always have to tip into something that I learn. Um, it's, 
you know, there was that big article for Jazz Festing in Place when I uh, talked about finding the Wolfgang's uh, materials, the recordings from the 1970 Jazz Fest. Um, so that was something I knew existed that I didn't know where or how to get to it, you know, and that was something that I had thought about and looked out for for you know, 20 years, I'd go to archives conferences and there'd be other radio archivists there. And I'd say, oh, you know, do you have any Pacifica radio? You know, do you have any uh, radio for Europe or, you know, so there are things that I know. Oh, well, you know what, Melissa, I have something up on my board right there. And it was a letter of somebody, um, we were talking about it. Uh, there's a, a something that mentions a recording and I was, talking to you about it. I can't remember what it was, but that was like three years ago. <laughs> so there's always things that are piloting around, but I don't have a holy grail at this point. Yeah, the nature yeah. Of, of archives work. And so now, oh yes. Mm -hmm. I just wanna say one thing. The sister collections, what I call my sister collections, you know, the historic New Orleans collection, which is, you know, that's that Michael P. Smith photo behind me. You know, you all, you know, have always been so gracious when I've been doing my exhibits and going in and letting me look through Dick Allen's papers. You know, those are just so, I mean, I, I was talking to the guy at our Hooli uh, during Jazz Fest and I mentioned some of what I learned in Dick Allen's papers. So doing the, collect, doing the research and finding out more about what is around us is, has been so helpful and it has really like the support of everybody else in the state museum have really helped this archive to get some really firm roots and to grow. So I can't, I can't thank everybody enough in our archival community in new Orleans. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> okay. There's a lot of questions that we have about 20 minutes. So let's start with a question from James, who was wondering if you could talk a bit about the difference between archival handling of recordings and materials, for example, digitizing old reel-to-reel -reel tapes or films versus non-archival amateur type practices and some of the difficulties working with old tapes. Um, so because we're such a small archive, we don't actually do that kind of work. We would we send that work out to experienced vendors to do that digitization. So I can answer just enough to be dangerous, so I won't. <laughs> um, but he can, if he wants, um, can drop uh, Joe, our digital archivist, an email. Uh, it's jstellaric at jazzandheritage.org, and I'm sending you his way because. Uh, Joe has done um, archival digitization. He worked for George Blood for many years. He's also an uh, audio engineer uh, so and has worked for OZ for many years, running one of the trucks at Jazz Fest, but he's also a master's in library science. He was basically uh, designed by God for us. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Joe could probably help with that question better than I will. Okay, next question. What is your favorite item in the collection? <laughs> That's hard. Uh, so I'll just talk about a general category. So we collect the unofficial stuff. So I, I love it when you see like community participation in Jazz Fest or in the foundation. So for example, um, one year at the Crew de Vue parade, uh, they parodied Jazz Fest and it was some scathing, you know, they're, they're, they really do satire at the Crew de Vue parade. Um, so collecting all of that material was very exciting for me. Um, I've seen, um, people scattering ashes at Jazz Fest. They were passing around a water bottle and shaking something. I was like, what is that? And then I realized 
that they were doing a funeral at the festival. So I took out my phone and started taking pictures. I contact, went over, contacted the people. We interviewed them. We found out who this gentleman was that died and how important it was. So I think that it's possible people make this festival and we really encourage and I enjoy that, uh, that sort of participation in the collection. Okay. The next question is, do you all offer PDs to educators? I, I'm sorry for the person who asked this, TJ, I don't know what PDs are. So if you want to type that in the chat um, and let us know. Professional development, okay, <laughs> to educators. Um, call me, we can talk about it. Nobody's asked me that question yet. So let's see if we can figure that out. Is there that are, good? <laughs> <laughs> there are a few questions and you've touched on various aspects of them already. I'm going to go down and just in case uh, to see if you want to touch on some more aspects. So uh, Margaret asks, does the archive contain historical Jazz Fest posters? I have a signed copy of the 1970 <laughs> Jazz Fest poster. The a signed copy of what year? The 1976. Oh. Uh, yes, we do collect, and I would love to see your poster. <laughs> I think I'm pretty sure we already have that one. We have a couple of gaps in our poster collection, but it's not 76. Also, how does one gain access to the archives documents? Is there a website and what can I do on the website? And I just posted a link to uh, the Jazz and Heritage okay. website in the chat. Um, yeah, it's always best if you take a look at our uh, online catalog and what we're what we have up. Um, and then from there, just give us a call or drop me an email. And uh, that's sort of when we because we're so small here and you know we only have a maximum capacity of like four people that can be here. And currently there's three of us here. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, just give me a call um, and we'll uh, see if we can, um, if we have materials that are value for what it is you're working on. Okay, and a question about volunteering. Do you all need volunteers to assist with the, uh, for the archive? How do you apply? <laughs> um, so there's no real application, but uh, I usually start with an email and if you can either send me a resume or if you're interested in archiving is opposite of your professional life, uh, just tell me what your general interest is. We try to give people uh, projects that they're gonna like <laughs> and not ones that they're gonna be bored with. Uh, so we do interview and we try to make sure that we have the right match uh, before we just take volunteers in. Um, but like I said, we also haven't quite started up yet with volunteers since uh, COVID, um, but I can't say enough how much work, like that Jazz Fest database, that was 90% volunteers that built that for us. And uh, we are forever grateful uh, for people that can do that kind of data entry. It's, it's just lovely. And it turns into this beautiful product. Frank asks, what projects are on the docket? <laughs> um, because we've had so much demand since 2019 for use of the collection and documentaries. So my big project this summer is going to be um, uh, looking at setting up a, like a strong administrative system. It's not very exciting, but it's that. Uh, Joe's big project this summer is getting our dam up and running for all of our photography. So it's going to be born digital, but then we're also hoping to put in like digital contact sheets from some of our older photography into the uh, dam so that it's more easily accessible and researchable. So those are our two big projects currently. Dolores is here. She's, you know, we buy artwork at Jazz Fest. So we're 
She's here uh, working on physical collections that have come in because we have some new artwork and some other materials. Um, George Ween's estate has sent us um, some materials from his house that he had uh, related to New Orleans. So that was really lovely. Um, but yeah, no, our, uh, and then potentially we're gonna, we have two big collections on the horizon. So I'm getting ready for those to come in as well. Um, but yeah, no, we always have something that can be done. And as archivists know, there's basic processing and then there's more detailed processing. So it's always a matter of nibbling away and making things more accessible. Awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of paper records do you have at the archive? Oh, good golly. Um, so a lot of our paper records are more administrative. So it would be, you know, in terms of like the Heritage School of Music um, and trying to recreate a lot of that. That's actually probably a pretty big gap in our collection because that was like a program that was at SUNO. And um, it wasn't as well, it was always a prize of the foundation. They did not uh, take very good care of getting those records here. So when Suno flooded in Katrina, you know, most of that documentation is gone. It was just flooded. Um, but we are, uh, we are, we do do annual collecting from inside the foundation and then also over with OZ. So we have a lot of administrative papers here in the archive um, that help us to recreate our own history. And then also pamphlets and flyers, like things like that, that are more uh, what we would call ephemera. And then of course, digital, you know, because David Friedman, the previous director of the of general manager of OZ, you know, he came and gave us three laptops. So, <laughs> you know, then we're processing those materials. So that the paper papers <laughs> go digital too. We have a few more minutes for more questions. If you could type them in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. There is one um, from Jay who says, can you say more about how money raised from Jazz Fest ticket sales fund the many community programs that benefit musicians and music workers and fund the Heritage School of Music? Sure. Um, so, uh, the founders of the festival, which is basically George Ween, his company was Festival Productions Incorporated. Um, and at a certain point, uh, I believe in 1998, Festival Productions New Orleans was established as Quint's company. So um, from the very beginning, the foundation has contracted with uh, FPI to produce the festival. So there's always been a contractual relationship between the two organizations. One of the other things that I learned was uh, in some oral histories was that was pretty much what FPI was doing because, you know, they did the Newport festivals in the 50s. So they would always either partner with a local nonprofit or create a nonprofit to uh, basically bring their, their festivals into being. So uh, we were one of the ones where we were created as a nonprofit. Um, so anyway, so we contract with festival productions. There is a festival budget. It is a part of the foundation. It was, it's overseen by our board of directors. Um, so uh, then when the revenues come in, that's when the money comes into the foundation at the end of each festival. And uh, so, you know, we get, I don't know how many millions of dollars, a few million dollars a year. All of our 990s are online. Um, so uh, through GuideStar, if you guys want to see what uh, foundation financials are. But uh, we take that money and then reinvest it into the community, either with uh, the whole diversity of our programs. And you can see all of our programs online too. We just did a big redo of our website and it's awesome. Okay. 
Anne posted a question for you in the chat. She says, question from left field. Has anyone from How I Ya ever consulted the archives to help design the Jazz Fest shirts? Um, no. Uh, so the How Are You shirts are uh, developed by Buddy Brimberg, who is also the person who makes the posters. It's art for now. Um, and I'm blanking out on her name, uh, but she's a silk painter and she usually has a booth of her own original work at the festival. So he primarily has been working with her consistently for probably the last 15 or 20 years. And it's those two who come up with what the design is going to be. And it's approved through the festival too, all of that. Anything that comes out gets approved through the festival because it's, you know, official merchandise. And Ron has a question uh, and would like to know if you have a fest highlight or peak experience at fest. I'm assuming that doesn't necessarily have to involve archival work. <laughs> okay, so I'll give I'll give two. Um, one, I would have to say, I think it was 2008, uh, Richie Havens in the Blues Tent. Uh, I literally thought the tent lifted up like six inches on his final, uh, you know, version of freedom. It was truly one of the most stunning things I'd ever seen. Um, and then one of my favorite little parts. So, you know, this year the festival did a great job. They're really doing sustainability and they're really working to integrate and make that a department within the festival, which is fabulous and I love it. But way back when uh, we used to partner with the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and they would be out there sort of picking up the bottles and cans and taking them. But of course, you know, you get a bunch of 12 year old kids and tell them to walk around and pick up cans and so maybe not the most effective. Um, but there were other points in festival history where we have been looking at doing recycling. Anyway, so my birthday is during Jazz Fest. It's April 26th. And it was in the morning and there was like nobody out there yet. So it was before the gates opened. And I still had like $2 starter on my pinned self. And these four Boy Scouts started just belting from 30 feet away, happy birthday <laughs> to me. And it was just so sweet. And they committed and they sang the whole song. So I was just like walking across the fairgrounds to go from one spot to the other. I don't know. I was, you know, working. So I was going to go and do something. And then I stopped and got serenaded by these four little Boy Scouts. It was just darling. <laughs> Those are my two little favorite, I think. Whoa. You know, and it talks about the spirit of the people there too, both of them, you know, in terms of the crowd and the audience and, you know. And they were my performers, my Boy Scouts. <laughs> There aren't any more questions in the Q&A box. So I will ask one final question because we are just about to reach time for today. What is, what is your favorite part of your job and work? And what is your favorite thing about archives? Why are your archives important? Um, so my favorite part about this job, and I'll just say this, which is I don't have a master's degree in library science. I have a master's degree in arts administration. Um, I never, I thought I was going to be a curator and not an archivist, but this is where I am. But now I curate an archive, right? So um, my favorite part about this job is that it's been positively bootstraps. You know, you saw those pictures, and, you know, we're in the French Quarter, so there are, um, I don't know if you can hear it, but there are uh, policemen outside. <laughs> um, so I love the fact that everything I've done, I've had to 
figure out myself. Like I never stop learning. I mean, I, I can't get bored here because as I've often said, I don't need another piece of paper to come in the archive and I can stay busy for another 10 years. Um, but there's always a chance to learn something new and do something new. And it tests my mettle. Um, and I think it makes me better informed about the profession of archiving and then also about um, the collection itself. So I love the fact that I never start, like this whole thing that I have to do this summer, it sounds really boring setting up a licensing administrative system, but it's another system that has to operate inside this system of archiving. So it all has to work together and relate. Awesome. And then what was, what was the other half? You had another half. Oh gosh, why is the Jazz and Heritage Archive important in your words? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, the Jazz and Heritage Foundation Archive is important because it is almost like this super salient uh, version of what Louisiana is. You know, we're, we, we play our collecting pretty tight, but the foundation and the festival, meaning FPI, they've done such a great job creating an authentic experience about Louisiana, including, you know, we have a folk life village out there. Um, and, you know, the materials that we collect from that, like the material culture of Louisiana is documented here as well. Um, and, you know, I just, that's why the festival is important. I think, and they've talked about this archive, you know, this was years ago, maybe going to a, a university, but if it had, it would have, it would have stopped because it would have been a smaller part of something much bigger. But with me here and us having a building and a very dedicated lens on putting these materials together uh, for the future is huge. You know, that's why, that's why this archive is important. Perfect. Thank you so much, Rachel, for your participation today and all your work over the years and to come. And I would also like to encourage each of you to keep in touch with both our repositories. I just posted in the chat links to Tusk and to the Jazz and Heritage Archive. And you can always reach Rachel or me <laughs> in our respective archives with all of your questions. Thanks so much for joining us today. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you all. <laughs>